Okay, so looking at uh, torsional buckling, so we're going to extend on the previous example that we uh, did where we had checked for local buckling. We also checked for cross sectional resistance. We checked, we, we, sorry, we estimated what the cross sectional resistance was. Um, and uh, we looked at what the flexural lateral buckling was for this section, which is a 356 by 368 UKC, uh, 129 kilograms per meter length. It was graded S275. Uh, it was length was uh, L was um, six meters in length and has applied load of 3000 kilonewtons in it. Now we're going to check for torsional buckling. So we've already looked at now at the, the theory behind it. And let's see um, if we can calculate it out. So we said that normally for torsional buckling, based on um, the laws uh, in the Euro code 6.3.1.4, what it uh, tells us is so tor check for torsional buckling. So we check this. Uh, in accordance uh, with uh, clause 6.3.1.4 of Eurocode 3 in 1993, part one, part one. Okay, that tells us that uh, in there that the critical length in torsion is normally equal to the overall length of the section, uh, unless there's some sort of special connections there, but typically it's length, the overall length of the section, which is six meters or 6,000 millimeters. So 1,000 millimeters uh, in, in a meter. Um, that's for, for a simply supported member, which we have. Okay, so we have a simply support, support number. So that's that's the first thing uh, that we need, that we uh, we're going to calculate. Um, next thing we know about this section uh, is so it's uh, the UK C section. So it's a, the UK C section. And so if that's the minor axis, the major axis, so we know it's doubly symmetrical. So it's doubly symmetric section. Therefore, shear center and centroid section uh, okay so the shear um the shear center and central section are located in the same place so that means that y naught is equal to z naught is equal to zero and then okay so that's the first thing uh, we, we recognize by it. So then we go to um, torsion buckling um, resistance. So when we go into SN001, so the guidance document SN001, that tells us it's critical um, axial load in CRT for torsion buckling mode. We calculated from this formula uh, in there. So we want to work out the uh, radius of gyration is first. So this is the radius of gyration. So because it's a doubly symmetrical uh, section, then we have y naught is equal to zero, and z naught is equal to zero. Uh, and then we can go to the blue book. So from the blue book, we get what the radius of duration. So the radius of uh, duration about the stiffer axis, oh, the major axis. Y, uh, which is equal to 15.7 centimeters, and the radius of duration about the minor axis is I Z uh, again from the blue book, so it's 9.44 centimeters. Okay, so that implies um, that 
I not. Uh, is equal to the square root of the major axis uh, range of duration squared plus the minor axis range of duration squared, which equals to the square root of 15.7 centimeters squared plus 9.44 centimeter squared. And that's going to give us uh, back out centimeter squared, which is 18.29 centimeters. Okay, so that's the first thing in, in it. Um, also from the blue book, directly from the blue book, as shown in the uh, previous lecture. So directly from the blue book, we can get um, the uh, warping constant. W. Uh, so the warping constant is 4.18. Is the unusual unit d m uh, to the power of six? So that's 4.18 millimeters. Um, power of oh, sorry, 4.18. Like four point oh. So that's equal to 4.18 uh, by uh, 10 to the power of 12 millimeters to the power of 6. Okay, so to get it over into everything into millimeters. Um, also from the blue book, we get the torsional constant. Uh, That's the torsion constant I T directly out of the blue book is 153 centimeters to the power of four. And again, we turn that into millimeters just to make it easier. 153 by 10th power of four and millimeters to the power of four. There's everything in in, uh, in millimeters. Um, and then we know that. Uh, so uh, from uh, EN 1993, part one, part one, we know that the Young's modulus uh, E equal to 210,000 newtons per millimeter squared. Okay, so we know what the uh, Young's modulus is. And uh, we know what the uh, <coughs> shear modulus. Okay, so the shear modulus here G is eighty thousand seven hundred seventy newtons per meter squared. Okay, so I think that's everything that we need from. Uh, from the table, well, as we said, that the length, the torsional length, equals the overall length. So, uh, so we can put that into the formulas here. So, so then we have the uh, critical uh, critical elastic load for torsional buckling that is equal to one over. So we're using this formula here at the top of the page. Now, one into pi naught squared. So I naught squared is 182.9. Make it into uh, millimeters. That's millimeters squared. All into G, uh, which is 80,770. That's newtons per millimeter squared. Multiply by IT. It is 153 10 to the power of 4 millimeters to the power of 4 plus pi, which is 3.14 squared times 210,000 
times the warping constant uh, in there. In that space. 4.18 by 10 to the power 12. All divided by the length. Uh, and the length uh, is 6 meters. 6,000 uh, millimeters squared. Okay, so sorry, I forgot the units there. Units per millimeter squared and millimeters for four. So I'm going to put all that in. So it gives me in C, R, and T. I'll back out of it. I'm going to get 10,900. Probably 10 to the power 3 newtons. Okay, so I get the uh, critical torsional buckling. Uh, resistance is 10,900 um, kilonewtons, or 10,900 by 10 to the power 3 uh, newtons. Okay, so the next step then I need to do, I need to work out what the ascendus value is. So I've now worked out, so I know that it's, uh, it's a class 3 section. Okay, so we've worked out that it's a class 3 section. So we did that in step one where we looked at the classification of the section. And by uh, use equation 652, which implies that the normalized stimulus for the torsion is equal to the square root of A, Fy, all over N, Cr. Okay, so that means that normalized stimulus value torsion is equal to the like, root of the A cross-section area, uh, which is 164 centimeters squared, 64 centimeters squared, this millimeter squared, times 275 newtons per millimeter squared, that's above the line, that's a cross-section resistance, divided by Divided by the torsion of Buckley uh, resistance is 10,900 by 10 to the power of 3 uh, newtons. Okay, so we look at the dimensions here to see how we get now in our dimensions. So we have newtons below the line, newtons above the line. We have millimeter squared here, we have per millimeter squared. So that's uh, unitless. So we know we're right because um, um, it has to be unitless. But it's a normalized in this value, so it's unitless. So that will work out as 0.643. Okay, so that's the normalized in this value uh, for it. So that's the normalized in this value for the elastic torsional uh, buckling force. Okay, so next thing then, if we go back to clause uh, 6.3.1.4. What clause 6.3.1.4 tells us if we go to the third uh, part of that, it says for torsion or flexor torsion buckling, the appropriate buckling curve may be determined from table 6.2, considering the one related to the z axis. Okay, so we're going to that uh, table. So this is back to the table we did before. Uh, so we know from our initial calculations, what we did for the lateral buckling, that h over b is approximately equal to 1. So it's less than or equal to 1.2. So sorry, it's a roll section that we're looking at. The height of the section and divided by the width of the section is approximately equal to 1 for this section. So it's less than or equal to 0.12. You know, the thickness of the flange is less than or equal to 100 mil. And what this tells us when we're looking at, uh, sorry, when we're looking at torsional uh, buckling, we look at the around the z-axis. Okay, so that means around the z-axis. We have grade S275 steel. Uh, so therefore that tells us to use a buckling curve C. So table uh, 6.2 um, implies uh, buckling curve C. Okay, so that's the, that, that tells us what table we're going to go to. So then we go to table 6.1. We have buckling curve C. So that tells us the imperfection factor. It was 0.49. Okay, thus uh, for buckling 
or uh, C. Tim 6.1 that tells us that the imperfection factor alpha is equal to 0 0.49. Okay, so now we can get uh, uh, what the phi value is because we know what the normal residuous value is and we know what the alpha value is. Okay, so phi. So what's the final value for NCRT? Okay, so in NCRT is 10,000. Um, Final value for the NCRT um, for the torsional buckling critical axial load here is 10,900 um, by 10 to the power of 3 newtons or 10,900 kilonewtons. Okay, so that's what NCRT is. And then we bought CRT uh, in here below the line, so NCRT is below the line, so NCR, in the case we're looking at elastic torsion, torsion flexural force, so that's NCRT. Uh, and we put that in underneath the line here, which is 10,900 kilonewtons or 10,900 by 10 to the power of 3 newtons. And the cross section resistance on the top, which is the area of the FY, divided by the um, elastic uh, critical torsional buckling force on the bottom. That gives us a normal resistance value of 0 0.643. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, then we went to table 6.2. We looked about the ZZ axis based on the, on the dimensions of the cross section. We found out that we use buckling curve C. So basically, that the height over the width is less than the recurve 1.2. Thickness of flange is less than 100 millimeters. About the ZZ axis for grade S275 steel, we use buckling curve C. Then we can go to table 6.1. Using buckling curve C, get the imperfection factor alpha as 0.49. Yeah, we've got that. Now what we're starting to do is we're looking at what the phi value is, which is 0 0.5 into 1 plus alpha. And uh, normal resonance value minus 0 0.2 plus um, uh, normal resonance value squared. So we can do that. We'll work that out. Okay, so it's equal to 0 0.5 into 1 plus alpha into uh, normal resonance value. Minus 0.2 plus alpha value squared. That's equal to 0.5 into 1 plus 0.49. It's normal resonance value, which is 0.643 minus 0.2 plus 0.643 squared. Equals, I'll just calculate that, I haven't that worked out. Um, 6.43 minus 0 0.2 times 0.49 plus 1. Um, plus 643. If that worked out right, it's 0 0.815. So then the reduction factor. For torsional buckling. So remember last time we did this uh, was for flexural buckling or lateral buckling. This is for torsional buckling. So the reduction factor for torsional buckling is equal to 1 all over. Phi plus the square root of phi squared minus the torsional or the non resonance about the, the torsion. It's 1 over 0.815 plus the square root of 0.815 squared minus 
0.643 squared. Okay, so to work that out. Uh, 0.815 squared minus 0.643. The square root of all that. Um, plus one point eight one five. This is approximately 0 0.763, if I'm calculating it right on my phone. Okay, so that's the normal this value. If we think back to what the normal is, or sorry, that's the reduction factor. That's the reduction factor for torsional buckling. Um, this is 0 0.763. If we think back, what was the torsional, or what was the reduction factor for, for, um, uh, for lateral buckling about the minor axis, it was 0.713. So 0.713, that value became 0.713 for um, torsional buckling, whereas 0.763, um, sorry, 0.713 for lateral flexural buckling, when we calculate in the last step, um, the reduction factor was 0.713 for lateral flexural buckling, whereas 0.763 for torsional buckling. Therefore, Lateral buckling will happen before torsional buckling because the reduction factor uh, is a smaller number. Okay, we'll just work out what the what the value is here, and just for completeness. So the, uh, the torsional buckling resistance value in here is going to be equal to this reduction factor times the cross section resistance divided by gamma m naught. So we have 0 0.763 um, times the cross section resistance 4510 all times uh, 1. So, uh, oh. So this is the uh, uh, torsional uh, buckling resistance. So no point seven six three times four five one zero millions divided by one. Three, four, four, uh, three kilonewtons. And so then the overall open resistance is uh, the minimum. Lecture buckling about the major axis. In B Y R D flexure buckling about the minor axis. It's in B Z R D and um Torsional uh, buckling resistance in the T R D. Okay, 
so that was three, four, four, three. And Newton's, I what the other values were. Three, two, one, five. And it was 91.913. My, my axis is 3215 and the major axis was uh, I didn't work that out but it was 91% 91.3% multiply by 4510 so it's uh, 4.17 Okay, we've, uh, we've booked in about the major axis, booked in about the minor axis, and torsional booked in, and it's the smaller of all of those three, so the smallest of all those three is that. So that implies um, overall booked in resistance. In B R D is equal to three, two, one, five. Okay, so it's driven by uh, lateral uh, buckling or lateral buckling or flexural buckling about the about the minor axis, and then that means that the utilization ratio. Um, for for buckling, I remember in compression. Uh, is equal to the axial uh, applied load in ED divided by the booked in resistance. Okay, and we said that we have 3000 kilonewtons applied. For example, uh, we have 3,000, uh, 3,215 kilonewtons of uh, resistance. Uh, and we said that it's going to buckle laterally first before we get torsional buckling. Um, so it's going to buckle laterally about the minor axis before we get torsional buckling. Um, so that uh, ratio there is equal to 3000 divided by 3215 is equal to 0 0.933, which is less than or equal to 1. So implies it's okay. In other words, you know, 93.3% of available capacity. Is used. Okay, so we have another 6.7% uh, or so available uh, to us afterwards. Okay, so that's uh, that's the torsion buckling resistance value. That's that example example done. Uh, a follow-on example, a related example for this would be that you know check the suitability of the same section. So three five uh, six point three six eight UKC one two nine grade S two seven five. Uh, where we've increased the load at the NED to 3,500 instead of 3,000. But it's also got a mid-height restraint around the ZZ axis. So we can see here, um, so we can see here that halfway up along the member, uh, so it's a six meter long member, but halfway up along we've restrained it from moving in and out of the page here. It can still move left and right, uh, but it can't move in and out of the page. So if I look at what does that mean? Um, so this this section can still buckle laterally like this about the major axis. So that's uh, the critical buckling about the major axis. Sorry, about the yeah, major axis is equal to six meters. Okay. However, if I look at the other direction, look at the member in the other direction. Yes, yeah, so I look at that same member in the other direction, about the minor axis uh, direction. It's the same member. Got the web that's hidden in behind the flange. And then we've got the sections 
it comes in from one side, section that comes in from the other side. Okay, so that's stopping it from uh, moving sideways. So in this example here, in the uh, minor axis direction, we've got the critical um, opening end about the minor axis direction is equal to three meters. Okay, so we follow the same same steps as before, except um, L C R Y is equal to six thousand uh, millimeters. That's as before. Okay, so that's uh, that's as before. That hasn't that hasn't changed. Okay, so that's the same as what we had just uh, calculated in there so that means that we're going to get the flexural buckling resistance about the major axis and here is 4117 kilonewtons that would mean that the buckling about the major axis is uh, equal to as i say sorry 4117 that means that the buckling about the major axis is equal to 4117 kilonewtons so that's as before um but lcr Z is now is equal to 3,000 millimeters. Yeah, so 3,000 millimeters uh, in there. So what does that mean? Well, then that's going to affect the normalized cylinder's value. Oop. That's going to check affect the normalized cylinder's value, which is the critical length about the Z all over the um, base generation about the Z axis. So the critical around the Z is 3,000 millimeters all over the radius of gyration is 94.3, which is straight from the blue book, like what we had done previously. It's got 31.8. Okay, so we've got uh, 31.8. So we've got the slenderest value equal to 31.8 uh, and then we have the normal cylinder's value is equal to the cylinder's value divided by the reference cylinder's value uh, remember we said the reference cylinder's value um, was equal to 93.9 epsilon and epsilon where we said that epsilon is equal to the square root of 235 all over fy equals the square root of 235 in this case all over 275 uh, and uh, that's equal to the page uh, 235 divided by 275 0.924. So that's equal to 31.8 divided by 93.9 times 0.924. Of course, it out. So 31.8 divided by 3.9 and divided by 0.924. So it's normally in this value about the z-axis is equal to 0 0.3665.
Yes, yeah, so it's uh, significantly uh, changed from last time. I think it's somewhere around, it should be somewhere around a half or so of what it was, what it was last time. Um, so then, um, I'm still going to use booked in curve C as last time because it hasn't changed. That came from table uh, six point. To the 6.2. Um, that's going to give us the imperfection factor. Alpha, uh, which equals 0 0.49. 0 0.49. Again, that was came straight. Uh, 0 0.49 came straight from uh, table 6.1. Yeah, so now we can work out um, what the uh, phi value is. Okay, so uh, one plus alpha into normal sinus value minus. 0.2 plus normal in this value squared. Again, we're looking around the zz axis. So let's say 0.5 into 1 plus 0.49 uh, into 0.3665 minus 0.2 plus 0.3665 squared. So we work that out. Let's work that out. So minus 0 0.2 equals 0.49 equals plus 1 plus 0.3665. So we'll do that right. 0 0.608. Um, and then the reduction factor of the z-axis is equal to 1 divided by 5 plus the square root of 5 squared minus uh, normalized in this value squared. So 1 over 0 0.608 plus 0 0.608 squared. Uh, minus normal in this value 0 0.3665 squared. So work that out. Oh. Sorry, just disappeared off my calculator there. Wait, I'll try it again. 0.608 minus 0.3665 squared. And 0.2353. Uh, plus 0 0.608 um, 193. Okay, so that's worked out right. 0 0.915, that's the reduction factor. 0 0.915. So that implies that the, um, the buckling resistance about the z axis now we go to 0 0.915 uh, times. Um, to cross section resistance, which is 4510, divided by shear factor safety, which is 1. Um, 
Okay, so that's 4126 kilonewtons. But last time I got uh, about the major axis. The major axis is 417, uh, 417 kN, hasn't changed. Minor axis was 3215, uh, but now 3215. Now it's, six, it's 4126. Uh, so now it's not the minor axis that's critical, it's actually the major axis that's critical. So we'll just write that out. Um, so remember what they are. So about the buckling about the major axis. Got as equal to four one one seven. Talking about the minor axis. Now four one two six four one two six. Okay, uh, Newton's. And if we if we check again what the top end is equal to three meters. And it's going to be equal to approximately equal to something like 0.9 or so uh, in there. So it's going to be something around the same. 1.9 and 5 or so. Possibly it's the same. Okay, so they're all going to end up being around the same. Okay, so there's a possibility for that. So plus in by rg is approximately equal to in B. It just happens in this case that they're all possibly equal to each other. In B, D, R, J. Okay. But take the uh, Buckling resistance as smallest of the tree. Okay, so if you go through the calculations, I'm not going to go through them all, all again here. If you go through the calculations, uh, do the exact same calculations as we just did, the torsional buckling resistance, uh, this time with the critical length is three meters, you get a reduction factor of around uh, 0.915 or so, it could be 0.912 or 0.91, something around that value. So we can see that the buckling about the major axis was 4117, buckling about the minor axis was 4. Uh, point or sorry, 4126, and the torsion is going to be around the same. So we've now enhanced the cross section resistance. How we enhance the cross section, or sorry, the overall buckling resistance of this member? Well, how do we do it? We had the member uh, here. Uh, with the, what we did is we put in some lateral um, resistance across the middle. So now that we reduce down the um, critical buckling about the uh, critical buckling length about the about the minor axis, the half of what was uh, previously from six meters down to three meters. What that did, in, what that did for us then, uh, it gave us a very enhanced um, buckling resistance about the major axis. Sorry, about the minor axis, lateral buckling resistance about the minor axis, and also enhanced our torsional buckling resistance. The um, value around the Lateral buckling about the major axis remained the same uh, because the critical length about the major axis didn't change. That was still six meters. Uh, whereas we managed to reduce down the critical um, buckling length about the minor axis to three meters. And the same for the torsional value uh, to be equal to three meters. Okay, so we didn't change the section size. We just managed to put in some lateral restraint in there, and that meant uh, that we could. Um, have a, a 
enhance capacity. So lots of questions here. So where does this uh, 4,117 kilonewtons come from? So I see the original calcs in example uh, one. Uh, where uh, critical uh, sequence is six meters. Okay, so to get the um, so hopefully I brought that right number forward. So the original calculations um, that we did for example one, where we had the critical. Um, length about the major axis is six meters. That's where we got the um, open resistance about the y axis is 4117 kilonewtons. Okay, so I think that's uh, be that example done. Okay, so what we've covered so far, we've covered local bulk length. Um, so we let me show the start of the solution again for one second. Start of the solution. Uh, so this start of the solution here. That's to show the start of the solution again for one second. Okay, so start of the solution. So as I said, we follow the same steps as before, uh, where we have the, um, the buckling length critical buckle length about the major axis as uh, 6,000 millimeters or six meters as before, as we had calculated last time. That's what gave us the, uh, we just took the same value then for the buckle length about the y axis, 4,117 kN. Change though here now is this time is because we have restrained the member um, now halfway long, along the length, it's 3,000 millimeters. And from that, we could work out what the uh, slenderness value is. Uh, by putting in 3,000 above the line, I'm putting in the radius of duration straight from the book below the line, and that gave us then a lower slenderness value. So the slower the slenderness value is, um, the higher its capacity in the lateral buckling. So if you think about your ruler, you get your ruler again, try and push your ruler, leave it on the, the one end on the table, push it down from the top end uh, down onto it, and see a buckling outside of it. So then if you catch halfway along the length of that ruler with your fingers, stop it from moving out sideways uh, in there and you'll see that the open resistance now will increase by about four because we've, we've, we've changed the, um, the critical buckling length um, so therefore it, uh, it's about half and so if you put, change the L on below to about half squared so it should increase the buckling capacity by about four times. Okay, so we did local buckling, so that was basically where we did the classification of the section. That was the first step. And then that told us then what we could use, um, gave us what the formula, the formula uh, for cross-section resistance. Yeah. Okay, that was the first step we did. Still can step there, we did the flexure or, or lateral buckling. So we checked it about the major axis. We also checked it about the minor axis. Okay, so we know that the minor is going to be the weaker one, so that's the one that's going to drive the, um, the resistance, the overall buckling, lateral buckling resistance of the section, unless we put in some sort of a, a um, lateral support or lateral restraint along the member, like what we did in the second example there. And then that changes the effective length about the minor axis, but kept the same effective length about the major axis. And then the major axis became more critical for flexural buckling. And then we checked for uh, torsional buckling, MBTRD, uh, and we worked out our torsional buckling. And the last step in the whole buckling calculation that we might have to check for is uh, torsional flexural buckling. In other words, we might get a twisting of the member and uh, a lateral movement out sideways of the member as well. So the combination of both of those. We did a, the example yourselves last Friday, which was the compression member design, uh, where it was a closed section. It was a, a rolled hollow section uh, that we applied, and we only had to check local buckling and flexural buckling because um, it's a closed section. So there's not going to be any, um, it's not susceptible to torsional buckling or torsional flexural buckling in there. 
some members, like when we were designing the member intention, uh, we also design the members in compression, and those sometimes we have these interesting loading in them. So this section here, this example, uh, similar to the one that we uh, showed intention, is a um, uh, is an L section, an angle section. So we may have the bolt in here. We're passing the load through this point. So this is where the, the load has been applied through this point here. However, uh, the centroid of the section is up here. So then, therefore, uh, where the load has been applied, the distance to the centroid is the eccentricity of E. And we know then that a load times the eccentricity, that gives us a moment. Okay, so moment is equal to the load applied times the eccentricity. So in this example, similar to in the example in tension, we've, we've, we're squashing this member from both ends. But because the load has been applied, it's centric to the centroid of the section. Therefore, we get a moment that we have to take into account. So there's going to be some stresses in that member due to that moment, due to the load times the eccentricity, and also stresses due to the axial load that's in it. We need to take that into account. And similar then um, to our tension member, we have two rules that we can do. One, we can analyze the bending moment, uh, work out exactly what the bending moment is due to the eccentricity, and include that in the design. Or if it's a light, uh, say, rolled section, like in this example here, uh, we can use an approximate method, which is an Annex BB1, uh, where we can basically change normalized cylinder's value that we've just worked out and put in an effective uh, normalized cylinder's value in there. So it's justified, um, similar to the, how we justified um, for the member intention, we justify this because the eccentricity that we're looking at is reduced away from the connection. Because as you move away from the connection, the stress is associated with that uh, moment that's induced by the eccentricity are reduced down. So such methods have been accurately calibrated using test data. So for example, getting uh, uh, struts of um, RHS members, RSA members, sorry, rolled uh, section angles, uh, and putting them into a machine. Therefore, you can get the normalized sinus value, the effective normalized sinus value about these uh, three different local axes uh, in there as being uh, these equations in here. Okay, but to be able to, for this to be able to be true, uh, the section struts must have at least two bolts at the end of it. So if we only have one bolt, we can't use these equations. We have two bolts, we can use these equations. So we're going on to uh, doing our project. We're going to use this in our project. So I'll explain all this in more detail when we get on to the project. Uh, effectively, normal sinus values we calculate are very similar, uh, and then we use these formulas then to get the effective uh, values in there. So that's it directly from the Eurocode 3, part 1, part 1, and it's BB 1.2. Uh, in there, it says if we have at least two bold members, we can use this for booked in about the v-axis, the y-axis, the z-axis, and we're using the normal sinus value as per the definition that we used uh, previously. If we have only one bolt for the connection at the end, these interests should be taken into account using 6.2.9 in the book in there. Typically, we'd have two bolts, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, and we're going to use, uh, we're going to look at this um, example uh, of a roll section, uh, and these are the different axes. So again, we can go to the blue book, and uh, we can find that uh, section in the blue book, we can get all the, the um, various different properties of the section straight out of the blue book. So we'll do that example. Um, when we get on to the uh, project, okay, so I'll do that when we get on to the project. So that's where I'm going to have, um, finish at that for the compression members. Um, as I said, when we, when we start the project, I'm going to look at the torsion, I'm going to look at that eccentricity uh, load. Uh, let me see. And I will also cover a case where we have a torsion flexural buckling uh, value as well. Okay, so I'll do the torsion flexural buckling and I will do um, the example uh, here. Um, a compression member when we get in, in a couple of weeks time we'll get on to the project because that will help to recap on the compression member design that we've done um for when you start the project again so what i'm going to do move on to next on friday is i might do check i like to do um connections uh, or i will do um beam design so now I'll, I'll have to think about it which i'll do first beam design or connection design Yes, I'm just going to stop the recording here. Okay.